everybody. Whoa, whoa, whoa that voice crack. Welcome back to another video. Today I will be going over five backrooms levels with no known exits or that are just extremely hard to leave. These are essentially trap levels that once you get inside of them, you're probably not going to get out alive. The levels in today's videos are some of my favorites, so I do believe you will also enjoy them. And if you want more long videos just like this, drop a like for the old Brewster. I would really appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for your support. Sit back and relax, grab some M&Ms, maybe a root beer or something like that, and enjoy some terrifying levels that cannot be escaped. Also, go check out Spoogly. It's about to hit 100,000 subs. I love you all. Bye. Backrooms level negative seven has been given classification of a class five difficulty and is heavily unsafe. The level itself is stable and there's really one single entity that calls this place home. His name is Johnny and uh, <laughs> we'll get into him later, I promise. The level is highly dangerous and should be avoided at all costs. But if you or another wanderer find yourself stuck in it, you're gonna have to watch this video to figure out how to escape. It takes the appearance of an extensive and winding set of hallways and rooms that appear to be from a house complex. The house itself is non-linear, which means the layout and the design makes no sense, and the hallway's physical spaces do not follow any physics from real life. The hallways seem to wrap around a central location inside the level, which is known as the dining room. Now, the dining room is a horrifying place with deeply disturbing descriptions given, and if you find yourself walking around the hallways and you end up in this dining room place, you're gonna want to run away as fast as you can. The dining room looks just like an empty room with a table in the middle of it. The room is barely lit up with a dull overhead light, and just be warned, what I'm about to describe is grotesque. On the table in the dining room, you will see disembodied heads on the plates. The plates themselves are set a few inches apart from each other, and the heads on them are all different, and they're all on different levels of decay. Obviously, I can't show the full image, because YouTube would probably slap me in the face and delete my channel, so you're gonna have to imagine. Use your imagination, you know? But the heads are thought to belong to the unfortunate wanderers who made it to the dining room and didn't leave in time before he got to them. Again, I'll explain him later, him being Johnny, but just know never to stay in this dining area for a prolonged time and never make any loud noises to attract Johnny, unless you want your head on a platter. The main characteristic of these hallways and rooms are that they're shrouded in a dark mist. Now, it's not that the level itself is actually dark. It's that the darkness seems to be real here. You can kind of feel when you cross over into it. It feels like mist or a fog in the morning. Anyways, this darkness and this physical lack of light floats around the basement and covers different parts at different times of the level. There are occasionally light switches on the walls here, but it is imperative that you never turn on the lights, ever. Never do it, because turning on the light switch would reveal your location to Johnny, which is, of course, the worst thing you could do to yourself. It is possibly the worst fate in the backrooms, actually. It is important to note that this level is not infinite, nor is it very large. It's a finite place with only a select few floors and hallways and rooms to explore. The level's ambience is not absolute silence. There's actually a strange collection of sounds constantly echoing to the carpeted hallways. You cannot really refer to it as music because it's not really like musical. It's more like random notes and sounds playing in an unnatural and liminal way. Anyways, the sound is constantly beeping overhead, and it's really the only thing that you can hide under from making noise to not attract Johnny. I mentioned just now that the level is multiple stories, and that's true, and there are different sets of staircases that you can take up or down to get to the two other floors. All three different floors have unique styles and design decorations, but they all follow the same house, hallway, and room style that the entire level does. When you walk up or down one of these staircases to get to the other two floors, the way you came from will shut and go away behind you, essentially forcing you to walk through this new floor until you find the exit back where you came from. 
In total, there are three zones per the first two floors, and the final third floor has one single zone. This is referred to as the end zone. Now, the end zone is not actually a real zone you're going to explore. It's more of just a big room with a door on the other end. The door is locked until you find the key to unlock it, and the key itself is randomly placed inside the rest of the level. The rooms in this level are empty and they're plain. Usually at most there might be a desk or a bed or a chair or some other random piece of furniture, but all of it seems to be from real life. Keep these furniture pieces in your mind because you might have to hide under them to evade Johnny. The hallways on these floors seem to shift when you're not looking, which adds to that non-linear nature that I mentioned earlier. This makes it really hard to map out where you're headed or where you're going to be, so just think of these hallways as a Rubik's Cube that can shift. This is very important because you might find yourself running away or trying to hide from Johnny, and the hallway switch could be to your advantage or be to your detriment. It could bring Johnny closer. This Johnny figure that I keep mentioning is horrifying, and I'm about to explain it right now. The entity is only referred to as Johnny because there are strange invitations scattered around different levels of the back rooms, inviting people to Johnny's dinner party. And this level is the dinner party. He's the reason for those disembodied heads on the table, and is also the reason you should never turn the lights on in the halls, unless you just don't want to be alive. Physically, Johnny seems to be a shadowy, dark entity of an unknown physical size. Most people that see him really don't survive the encounter to give accurate details, but from the few that have, or the few that have pictured him, he seems to be a grotesque, dark shape with large white eyes. He smells of rot and decay, and he behaves very sadistically and malevolently. Johnny can sense when lights turn on in this level, and the second one does, he will sprint at an unnaturally quick pace to that location. That's how he hunts. He seems to mainly hang out in that dining room area where those heads are at, at the center of the level. So if you wander that room, or if you accidentally get there on purpose, it'll be the last thing you do, most likely. Johnny's attacks are vicious and aggressive, and he will slash and bite and do anything in order to despawn you or his victims. After this, he will then take their head back to the table for display. He kind of seems to feed off of fear. It is unknown if Johnny is some kind of mutated entity, like a wretch or a hound or a redkin, or what his true form is. But since the level is covered in this misty darkness and Johnny's full body has never been seen, we can just guess that he looks gross because he smells gross. Whatever or whoever it is, he does not like letting people visit the level and will do anything to get your head on his table. If you want to survive this level, and Johnny specifically, you need to do the following. If you hear footsteps outside of a room that you're in, you need to hide quickly and quietly. If the music on this level stops playing while you're exploring, you also need to hide. This means that the entity Johnny is nearby. This creature as a whole strikes fear into thousands of wanderers inside the back rooms. He's very taboo, very scary, and many people won't even go near this level because of how dangerous Johnny is. The only good news is that Johnny's eyesight seems to be bad because he's used to the darkness, so he relies so much on hearing and smell to hunt you down. This is where hiding under that furniture might save your life because he might not be able to see you under there. To enter the level, you have to touch a piece of paper on any other level that reads, You've been invited, inviting the reader to Johnny's special dinner event. If you find this invite, you can noclip through it to come here, but if you also find it, you should shred it and never touch it again because it would be the worst thing you could do to yourself. To exit the level, you need to search the different rooms of this level to find these magnetic key fragments that all come together to make a full key to use to unlock the door in the end zone. Now, the end zone is at the top floor of the level, it's the third and final one. You have to unlock the door on the other side of the room in the end zone to escape. The only problem is, some of these key fragments might be in very dark places, so you might have to use a light to find them. And what did I tell you about lights? They attract Johnny. So you have to do it for a split second, maybe one or two seconds at max, if you want to survive. That way Johnny doesn't have time to react. So Backrooms level 1411 doesn't actually have a classification graphic, so I'm going to make one for it. That's what I do. I'm gonna give it a classification of a class three difficulty due to its environment and its entities within, and it's just overall strange effect that it gives you. The level is actually created by another YouTuber named Nostalgia, and the description of the level is as follows. 
Level 1411 is a series of interconnected and interlooped hallways that are constructed out of a small tile. Think of like the pool room styles, but even smaller. The level's layout is kind of similar to level zeros and many others because it seems to have non-Euclidean geometry, which if you're not sure what that means, pretty much it means you could just be walking in a straight line, but actually end up behind where you started. Pretty much reality doesn't make sense. The level's roof above you is made out of tile as well, but it's black and not white or gray, and it actually absorbs light and sound which of course means there's gonna be no echoing and means that any light that's shining will get sucked up into the roof and it'll be dark in some areas. The level seemingly has these mannequins placed in very random spots in the hallways. The mannequins themselves are around six feet tall and they're made out of what we think is wood. They kind of look like those little stick figures from art class. You know the ones I'm talking about, but these are human sized. And these mannequins give off extremely unnerving energies and vibrations, and even though they don't have any eyes, you can feel them staring at you. And even if they don't seem alive, either they seem fake or whatever, they're alive. Trust me, they are. Each time you see a mannequin, you need to keep your eyes on that mannequin until you're out of its direct eye shot or until you can't see it anymore. Because if you turn your head or if you look a different way, they will silently move closer to you until they're in range of attacking you. Kind of like that apirophobia level, but in real life. Now, they don't attack you viciously or claw at you or anything. All they have to do is to touch you. Just a basic tap or poke on the shoulder and you'll be gone. If they manage to do this, then your bones will fly out of your skin and you will end up as a pile of just meat on the ground. Just a lumpy sack of flesh. Now, even though your bones are gone, the horrific part is that you're still completely conscious and sentient. Like you still know what's going on, but you won't be able to move or talk or do anything because you're just a flat piece of meat laying there. That's gotta be one of the actual worst things to happen in the back rooms. I mean, that's, that's horrible, wow. But if you somehow make it past these mannequins and don't get turned into a lump of flesh and you wander deep into the halls, you're still not out of the woods. Because like I said earlier, this level is full of these dark areas and these dark zones where there's no light because the ceiling and the walls absorb it. These areas are extremely enigmatic and they almost act as a sort of pocket dimension within themselves. So if you're walking for one second in the light, you see this dark area and then you walk into it, you'll be enveloped inside of this dark dimension. The entire light that was behind you will be gone and you'll be in complete darkness until you continue to walk the other way out of it. These dark areas, of course, attract smilers and other weird entities that live in the back rooms. You might even run across a phobic centipede or a skin stealer inside of these dark zones. We don't really know what all lives there, but you can take a guess. These types of entities like this type of level because it brings a lot of opportunity for easy prey. You know, the mannequins will just take your bones away for some reason, and you'll end up as lumpy flesh, and of course that is easy prey for some kind of creature. It really is unknown why the mannequins do this, but we have some theories, and I'll go over the theories later on in the video, but for right now, you just need to know that it does play a role in the level. Even deeper into these strange halls, there lies more weird, just, stuff. The first is that there's rumored to be a strange, enigmatic, floating eyeball type creature that, according to legend, is from the very first victim that was turned into a lumpy flesh pile by a mannequin. And over the years, this eyeball that was small grew into its own sentient being, and now it terrorizes the deep halls of this level. Anyways, the eyeball floats around in an unknown way, and it's, again, sentient in an unknown way, but if it sees you, it'll chase after you. Its ultimate goal, of course, is to absorb you into itself. Now, the good news is this eye can only see in one direction at a time, obviously the way it's looking. And since there's plenty of dark areas and corners you can hide in, I'm sure that you could probably evade it pretty easily. And unless you can't, then you're screwed. If you do encounter and evade the eye, then the exit of the level will make itself appear. And if you escape that eye, no matter where you're at in the level, you can look up to the ceiling and you'll be able to see a green glowing exit sign. All you have to do is follow that sign and you find the way out. But again, it's not that easy because there is another strange creature that lurks even deeper into the halls. It takes the similar appearance as the eyeball, except this is one giant yellow smiley face sphere thing. So it's just like a sphere with a smiley face. 
The face tends to lurk near wherever the exit is, and it picks off unsuspecting wanderers that think they're about to make it out. Which is kind of sad. Imagine like beating the entire level, running to the exit, and then getting eaten by a smile. Most normal backroom stuff, guys. Cool. An even deeper theory is that this smile face is the head of that first victim from the mannequin, like the eye was. Which leads us to the strange effects that this level might have, and the theories we have on it. So the eye and the smile face are these large, weird body parts that have morphed into their own entity. They've developed a consciousness, they've developed ambition and goals, and a drive to eat and whatever. This leads us to believe that the level has the ability to take these body parts of wanderers who got deboned by a mannequin and evolve them into entities of their own with their own thoughts and minds. Now, it's unknown if the Wanderer has any power inside of these creatures, or if nothing of them exists anymore, just their physical self blown up to be bigger, but it's definitely weird that the level can take these body parts and turn them into stuff like this. You know, giant eye, giant face, what other giant things are walking around deeper? I mean, you're gonna walk down and see a giant leg or arm walking around, we don't know, we just can't tell yet. Level 75 of the Backrooms, or the Gallium Caves, has been given a Class 5 survival difficulty for its very unsafe and unsecure environment, but it is devoid of entities, which is always a nice thing to not have to worry about, but the layout of the level is dangerous enough to where that doesn't matter. The level was discovered on March 3rd, 2019 by a now-deceased Meg operative, and the description of it reads as follows. Level 75 is a massive group of of narrow interconnected caves made entirely out of gallium. Now gallium is a chemical element and in this level it takes the appearance of a bluish gray metal that is very soft. In fact it's soft enough you could cut it with a knife. It's solid at room temperature but when it's heated ever so slightly it'll melt into liquid metal. I know you didn't click on this video for science class but all of that was important trust me. So gallium is the only material on this level. There is no stone, no dirt, no rocks, no fiber, nothing else that would be in a normal cave is here. It's all gallium. And as of right now, only approximately 10 kilometers of the level have been discovered, but it could be far more expansive. We don't know. The temperature inside of the cave here varies from 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 Celsius to 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 Celsius. And it typically drops and rises in temperature every three-ish hours. That's important because the melting point of gallium is approximately 86 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 Celsius. And since the caves heat up and cool down, they are in a continuous cycle of melting, solidifying, and melting all over again. Just you being in the enclosed space of these claustrophobic caves with your radiant body heat is enough to start the melting process. Since humans' body temperatures are hot, you know, like over 95 degrees, we radiate a lot of heat. A lot of heat comes off of us. And if you're touching this gallium with your hands or your knees or your feet, it'll inevitably heat it up to a above 86 degrees Fahrenheit and it'll start melting. The good news is that not all areas of the level are heated and cooled at the same time, which is nice, I guess. But if you are crawling through the cave or you're walking and you start to feel gallium dripping down on top of you, you've already sealed your fate and can no longer escape. Because by that time, the cave section you're in will melt into a soupy, hot, metal goo, ultimately suffocating the wanderer under literal tons of metal. When the gallium then cools down and resolidifies, it'll be in a completely different shape. Since it always drips and melts in different ways, this means that the layout of the cave constantly changes and can't be mapped. It also means that there are wanderers alone trapped inside of the walls and floors of this cave, entombed forever in these metal graves. Whoa, that rhymed. That was pretty cool. They unalived alone, unable to scream for help, just slowly sinking deeper and deeper into this melting gallium liquid. Okay, with that wonderful thought inside your head, let's move on. As I said, the shape of the cave system changes because of the metal dripping and cooling in different ways, but it also does because of the strong wind inside of the level. This wind is what heats and cools down the specific sections of it, and since gallium is very bendable under heat, when the warmer air blows through the cave, it'll warp and change the tunnel's directions into completely different areas. Areas. The tunnels here are still very small, and they're typically no wider than 5 meters and no taller than 2, which at maximum means they're no taller than 6 feet tall and no wider than 15 feet wide. 
you might have to crawl around in several parts or hunch over if you're tall. And that's where the danger is because you really can't move fast if you're crawling. You know, you, you can't sprint on your hands and knees, but yeah, just good luck. The entire time you're exploring the level, you will experience pitch black surroundings. And if you don't bring a flashlight with you, you'll be crawling through melty metal goo with no way to see, which would probably make it even worse. This level is the only known source of gallium in the back rooms in its metal form, which theoretically it could be used for conductors or electronics or even weapons in some regard. So some people have come here with a goal to mine the gallium and take it with them to make that kind of stuff. But most of them end up getting too cocky and not making that level before it melts and they sink down never to be seen again. Since the environment here is so harsh, not even entities can live here, which is, I guess, like I said, one less thing you gotta worry about, but on that same note, there are no colonies here either. So if you do manage to come here, you are all alone in these claustrophobic caves with no map, no tools, nothing to help you get out. You, you're on your own, dude. To enter the level, you can choose one of five methods that have been found so far. The main one is you can be on level eight, which is a cave level in and of itself. You probably already knew that, but you can find a silver cave, like a silver passage in that level, walk through it, and at the end of it is a pathway to get here. Or you can pick one of the others that's listed, but those are much, much harder to achieve. And to be honest, they're not really worth it because you gotta be like way on on level like 400 to come back here, which why would you do that? That's dumb. But more importantly, to exit the level, you need to find a patch of orange gallium and touch it to be sent to level 16. Now this is the most common method, but there are three other ones that you can try to use that involve finding specific hallways and specific passages to get deeper into deeper levels, but those also require you to get deeper into this level. So that wouldn't be very smart. Don't recommend that. Find the orange patch and you're gonna escape. I think this level is genuinely such a good and terrifying concept and it's terrifying in practice. I mean, imagine getting sent and stuck in a level where you have to crawl around in your hands and knees while every surface around you heats up because of your body weight and it eventually starts dripping on you and forming puddles of this metal that you simply will get stuck in like glue and you'll start sinking and sinking the longer and more you struggle. I think that's horrifying. Leave a like if you enjoyed it too. I think it's a great addition to the lore and I think it's an example of a level that does not need entities or something like that to be dangerous, just the environment environment here of this level makes it very, very dangerous. And I know that there's a ton of cave levels inside the back rooms. You know, I've gone over like three of them myself, but this one is so unique that I think it stands head and shoulders above the other cave levels. I might even like it more than level eight. But anyways, I, I don't want to get on a tangent or anything. Those are just some closing thoughts. Devil Town, or level 331, is the 332nd level in the Backrooms lore, and it's been given a class 3 survival difficulty and is very unsafe, very unsecure, and has a medium but very deadly entity count. The level appears to be a rundown, abandoned, and dark suburban town-like area that's in a perpetual state of pitch blackness. The sky inside this level, though, isn't the usual dark night sky, it's actually a crimson blood red color. Some of the lights on the structures in this level also emit a really soft red glow. Which if you know anything about the back rooms, you know that if there's red lighting anywhere, it usually means bad news is coming. The physical environment of this level changes depending on where you are. There are houses and there are buildings and there are stores and all those types of things. And all of them are abandoned, but you really feel like something's watching you. The air in this level smells corrosive and it feels heavy and the environment is just very oppressive. It has the sensation of almost the embodiment of evil. The majority of the buildings in the Devil Town are small houses and small convenience stores, but there are also things like apartment buildings and phone booths and mailboxes and skyscrapers and etc. All of which are fully explorable, but you should use caution while exploring them. The streets that cut through this town are made out of a dark black concrete, and the only things that you'll see on these streets are sometimes a slow car that's driving by. The cars drive in very arbitrary directions, and they do not follow a pattern, but there are cars patrolling the entire level randomly. You can't see if there's anybody driving it because the windows are tinted, but it's also really hard to see in general on this level because of an effect that I'm going to talk about right now. 
So every living thing on this level is entirely blacked out and everything looks like a silhouette or a shadow. The trees, the grass, the buildings, the entities, all of them can just barely be seen, and when they are seen, it's in the form of a shadow or an outline. This is due to the lack of light here, but it's also due to the fact that this level is just really anomalous. It's unknown how everything is blacked out. Even if there's a light shining on them, you still only see the black outline. The real danger with this effect is when it makes it hard to see the entities of the other threats near you. You know, since everything's already dark, if you're walking around the level exploring a house and you can't see something that's about to eat you, you're not gonna survive because you can't see it. Walking through these buildings here, you'll notice that they all seem abandoned, like I mentioned. Like, whoever was there left in a hurry. If you do explore buildings though, make sure you do not stay inside them for longer than one hour, because typically at around the hour mark, the building will start to crumble and decay right on top of you. The glass will start to break, the rafters will start to shatter, and everything will just crumble on top of you. Walking around the streets and just generally exploring the Devil Town will give you huge feelings of paranoia. You'll always have goosebumps on the back of your neck, your hair will be standing up back there, and you'll feel like you're being watched the entire time. Your body will constantly be on edge, and every slight movement will scare you. You'll be in fight or flight forever. You'll see dark shapes off in the distance running across the road. You'll see things in your peripheral vision moving, but when you turn, nothing's there. And this is just known to be a genuinely horrific level. Like, people avoid this on purpose because of how scary it is and how terrifying it makes you feel. There are a few level exclusive entities that live here that you should 100% be on the lookout for. Those are the kids, the devils, and the boogeyman. And I'm going to get into them right now. The entities known as the kids are very dangerous and they manifest themselves as short, dark silhouettes of small humanoids. It's unknown if they're actually children or if they're just small entities, but they're called the kids and they seem to be wearing some kind of mask or some kind of hoodie that hides their face at all times. The mask is a dark black material, but underneath it, the true face of the kid will be revealed. Typically, they're reported as having sinister red smiles carved into their faces. And if you see this off in the distance in the darkness, you'll need to hide from them. The kids usually stand right out of your view distance in really dark parts of the level, and they kind of wait for you to get out in the open so they can run up and attack you. They also are known to peer into windows and look through things to try to find you hiding. They watch, they stalk, and they have violent intentions. They only start to appear in the Devil Town when you've been here for a long amount of time. They will begin to slowly approach you, inching closer and closer every minute you're here longer, until eventually they're going to start to attack you, and it'll be all downhill from there. You're screwed. It'll start with pushes and shoves, and then eventually they'll start to stab you and hit you with objects, and it'll all lead up to them teaming up on you and consuming you. The good news is the kids will not venture inside of houses on this level, but something worse of course, lives inside these houses. The Devils are another level exclusive entity that live in the houses here. They manifest themselves as full-size, large humanoid shadows that are much more demonic in appearance and behavior than the children. Some have been seen to have long horns and tails and wings, and they're typically not actually interested in the humans at first. They'll ignore you unless you're in their way or unless you scare them out. Instead, they really don't like the kid entities. They actually hunt them down for sport. It's almost like they find them annoying. But if you do sneak up on a devil or something like that, you need to just slowly back away because scaring one is pretty much instant despawning. The last level exclusive entity that I'll mention today is the one we have the least information about. It's been nicknamed the Boogeyman, and there's nothing on it, literally. All we know is that he resembles a humanoid shadow that wears a trench coat and some kind of hat. The entity has been observed stalking wanderers from far away and stealing kid entities, and the devils here actually seem to avoid the boogeyman if they encounter it. So whatever this boogeyman is, it seems to be very powerful and very sinister. It watches, it waits, and when the right time comes, it will strike. The only other entity that's been seen that's not level exclusive is Smilers, and they glow completely red, like bright neon red instead of the usual white. Now, Smilers seem to be immune to that shadow effect where everything turns into a silhouette, and also the other entities don't even seem to care about them. They'll kind of just walk right past. But other than that, that's all the entities. 
To enter the Devil Town, you can find a black gate that's drawn in Sharpie or Expo marker on level 330, and you can no clip into that. And once you do, you'll wake up on your back in the middle of the Devil Town. Level 91 is the 92nd level inside the Backrooms catalog. It's been given a class 2 difficulty for the level being pretty hard to exit and for its environmental risks, which are definitely more prevalent. Since the level is a desert, it's going to be a little harder to survive. The good news is there's only a 1 5th rating for phenomena happening to you, which on the scale of backroom stuff, that's, that's pretty good odds. There's a sentence at the front of the document that says, quote, In the midst of the wretched backrooms, you are greeted with the West End. End quote. The level takes the appearance of a giant desert that looks to be a mix of the Mojave, the Sonoran, the Chihuahuan, and other deserts from the front rooms. If you're new here or just aren't aware, oftentimes backrooms levels and locations tend to look like places from real life, just in a different way, almost like it's a different font of that same thing. It looks familiar, but something is off. That's what I'm trying to say. And that's the case with this giant desert here. Because this level looks like these real life locations, some people are actually tricked into believing that this is the front rooms. But trust me, it's not. Don't get your hopes up. You're not in reality, I promise. The actual desert here consists of different flora and land formations, like mesas and buttes and plateaus and cannons and meteor craters, as well as trails and roads and mountain ranges. All of these are over top of a desert landscape that goes on for as far as the eyes can see. Some of these formations are grossly exaggerated in size. For example, some of the mountains are like 3,000 meters tall, and some of the canyons are way deeper than you'd think they would be. The majority of the ground here is made out of sand, and a little bit of it is made out of dirt, and a little less of it is made out of clay, and it's all depending on where you walk. If you dig in the ground on this level, and if you remove a bunch of sand, you're likely going to find skeletons and bones and shells deep inside of the actual ground. I'll touch on a little bit later, but we don't really know what these skeletons are from, considering there's no entities or life on this level. While walking around the desert, you might run into various bodies of saline, salty water. These come in the forms of small rivers and small ponds. Now, there are also freshwater bodies that you might be able to run into as well. They're rarer, and they act kind of like an oasis, where if you see one, you really need to take advantage of it and get a drink, because you don't know when the next time you're going to see fresh water is. As I mentioned earlier, there is a highway system that sprawls out over the majority of this desert, and that makes traveling over the level quite easy. The level's roads themselves are unmarked, and they typically have very few signs, and in general the directions these highways go are arbitrary because they lead to nothing. They seem to randomly be placed, and their stops and ends often make no sense. The only signs that you might see on these roads are stop signs and other ones that point towards towns that exist, which I'm going to get into in a second. Also along the roads, you might be able to see these weirdly placed billboards, which seem to advertise things like almond water and cashew water and even other levels themselves. It's like this level is literally advertising other ones. Pretty interesting. For some reason, the most commonly advertised levels here are the Promised Land and the Pool Room sublevels, which is ironic because those levels are the exact opposite of this one. You know, those are safe and watery, and this is a desert dry level. The billboards also often include reviews from wanderers who have been to them. It's almost like a hotel billboard from real life with a five-star review on it. Moving down the road even further, you will run across a few abandoned cars. Inside of the cars, you may be able to find rare necessities for survival. You can also rest and relax inside the cars if you're tired or if you're hot. But the only danger you might face while walking on these roads is actually a randomly appearing car. Now, this car is very anomalous, and it seems to drive up and down the roads randomly at a high rate of speed kind of just zooming back and forth, flooring it. The car has no one in it, it's unknown where it comes from or how it gets around, but it literally just flies from end to end and road to road without stopping. Even if you see it, it's not gonna slow down for you, so get out of the way unless you wanna be unalived. 
Signs of old and abandoned settlements are very noticeable here. These settlements often include things that every other town has, like gas stations, oil wells, houses, general stores, all that stuff. All of these places are empty and long abandoned, actually. These towns almost give off the vibe of an old movie set because it just seems like no one ever lived here. It's been that long. Inside these old buildings, you might find some old food or soured water, but other than that, it's really just nondescript and empty. All of these different settlements have been described by wanderers as eerie, simply because of just how empty they are. It seems like these towns were created for tourism at one point, because the majority of them have gift shops and travel centers, but no evidence of current life is attainable, so we're not sure how that works. But the settlements, like everything else in this level, are randomly placed, with no real sense of design put in them. Why would you put a town this far in the desert? It makes no sense. The weather inside this level can change, but it's usually partly cloudy or sunny, depending on the time of day. The sun in the sky seems to be some type of star, and it's not exactly like the Earth's sun, but it does lead to temperatures not being scorching hot. 33 Celsius, which is like 91 Fahrenheit, is the average, which is hot itself, yes, but it's not unbearable. And there is a 24-hour day-night cycle, just like Earth has, so it's pretty easy to sleep here as well. Essentially, this level is a desert with randomly splotched subdivisions, towns, and roads that cut through the whole thing. All of the areas are fully explorable and they're fully abandoned. And the hardest thing you're going to have to deal with is the environment here. As I mentioned briefly at the beginning, there is a small chance that phenomenon might occur to you as a wanderer while being on this level. The main two are called Phenomenon X and Phenomenon Y. These are the names that are being given to them, and I'll explain them both right now. Phenomenon X, or the blurriness, as it's been nicknamed, is a vision impairment event that occurs on this level. When one experiences it, a balloon from the real life vision tests will appear in a person's field of view, far off in the distance, just out of like where you can clearly see it. The balloon will be a strange feeling to the person experiencing it, and this strangeness will soon move into terror right after you see it. Because after staring at the balloon, the sufferer will get tinnitus in their ear, and your field of view will get really blurry, and your eyes will water, and you'll kind of just feel like all your senses are getting worse and worse and weaker. At this point, most people start to panic and get overwhelmed because their other senses, like their touch, their smell, their taste, get really weak, and you kind of feel like your arms and legs have pins and needles, and you'll really feel like you want to pass out. Now, the phenomenon will clear up by itself. You don't need to take medicine or anything like that, but you do need to find a dark and shaded, enclosed, preferably indoor, place to calm the effect down. If it happens when you're in the middle of the wild or on a trail in the desert somewhere, you're probably done for. Sorry about it. But the next phenomenon, phenomenon Y, is called carbon copying. And essentially, this occurs randomly again when wanderers get too deep in the level. What happens is the scene in your field of view, so whatever is right in front of you, will duplicate itself into two identical sections. This can make you really delirious or delusional if you don't recognize what happened, and eventually it could lead you down the wrong path in a completely opposite direction. For instance, if you're following a road and the level of carbon copies itself, and one road leads really deep into the desert, and the one you were originally following leads to the town, what if you pick the wrong one? You know, you could just be out in the desert for days, because after a few days, the phenomenon will wear off, and once it fades back to normal, you'll be completely alone. So watch out for that! There are no entities here, but the fossils that are in the sand indicate that there used to be some kind of life that roamed these sands. But the only report of creatures lies in weird tales that wanderers have said of shadow entities lurking around the abandoned towns. Now, these shadow entities are often accompanied by footsteps or whispers, and it's completely unknown if these are real or if they were just like the former inhabitants of the towns, like their spirits or something, or if they're just hallucinations. We don't know. I hope they're hallucinations because shadows are scary. But it seems as if the entire level is the embodiment of abandonment and loneliness. The aura is so mysterious, and each wanderer feels strange exploring these roads and these towns. It feels like you're not supposed to be here. 
To enter the level, you're gonna have to no clip into the ceiling of level 338.1, or you can find a lone stop sign on level 35 and then just interact with it, whatever that means, and you'll be sent here to a stop sign on this level. At the exit, this is when the level gets particularly difficult because you have to wander through a random sand dune field, which might maybe transition you to level 671. You might be able to also follow highway signs to different levels. We aren't for sure if these even work, but there are signs that lead to different levels. So good luck finding an exit. This level is full of classic liminal space images that I'm sure millions of people have seen, and it's really just a great embodiment of how the backrooms feels to be in. You know, when you think of the backrooms, you think of yourself alone in a harsh environment where nothing ends and nothing begins. And that's literally all this level is. Make sure you keep your bearings with you, make sure you keep your eyes up straight, and you might be able to make it out of the desert alive.